singing, as you can tell, my voice is not quite up to the... I can make the joyful noise, just not <laughs> in melody and in tune. Uh, please stand with me, take your Bibles and stand with me, and also take your hymnals and remain standing uh, as I read from God's Word this morning. Psalms 40. I'm oh, sorry, I said Psalms. It's actually Psalm. It's the book of Psalms. <clears throat> I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and he heard my cry. He brought me up also out of, out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he had put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. That's how I feel. I feel like he took this disgusting lump, you know, nothing, something that's not worthy of anything, and he put his spirit in me and he gave me a new song a new life song. And it is my pleasure to be able to serve the Lord and to be in service of this church in the way that he's called me to serve. And I just wanted you guys to know that uh, this, this what, we're what we're talking about today and what we're doing today, it is completely my honor. And it is the song, that new song that the Lord has put in me. And the Lord has a song for you as well. And it's to walk in His Spirit in the service of your Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus. And that song is going to be unique in a lot of ways, but it's also going to be right in unison with the rest of the, the wonderful symphony that He's created. So, um, it's, it's a blessing. Um, Gus, can you please come up and pick a few songs here and we'll sing those? There's a little bit up here last time. Yeah. Okay. All right. 228. Rejoice, the Lord is King. I thought you will. I thought I will. 228. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thou My Vision. It's almost a sequel to that song. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah perfect. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> chapter 11, uh, Terry very graciously asked if I would do our communion today, so that's what I'm doing. And uh, Kevin and Kevin, would you gentlemen want to help? Terry told me. Chastity, so. You didn't tell me. No, I didn't tell you, you told me. Oh, so Kevin has to do it. Has to, yeah, it's a law. Yeah, we have laws around here. Got a lot of problems, don't we? You might even take a second and think about. Now, this is, sounds counterproductive, I know, but, but we'll try and make it good. <clears throat> Got problems. See problems. Hear problems. Have problems. But the biggest problem we don't have, and that's sin, amen? Amen. It's uh, paid for, past, 
present and future. It's just gone. I mean, it's done. I mean, we've got our problems, but that's the real problem. It's all gone forever, forever. So that's what we're celebrating, amen? We're celebrating that because uh, there's no problem that's really that much of a problem compared to this one, amen? And it's taken care of. It's done forever. So, for the believer, um, Paul, and uh, we'll just get right into it, says, I received the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. This, of course, is 1 Corinthians 11, 23, our usual, or at least one of them, <clears throat> that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, uh, took bread. I'm always amazed at the presence of mind of our, of our Lord facing the cross, and here's what he was doing. When he had given thanks, he broke and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And at that point, the body wasn't broken. That was just a matter of hours away, wasn't it? And uh, verse 25, after the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show or proclaim the Lord's death till he come. So we have one more minute on earth. Let's use it to proclaim the Lord's death. Amen. So, uh, Kevin, would you ask the blessing on the bread? Lord, thank you for remembering us and giving your body for us so that we can, well, so we can go to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> So let's do our best just to get that mind back to that broken body, amen, and to be celebrate the absolute marvelous eternal payment for our sins. Let's eat for the to the Lord. And he took the cup. Gentlemen, would you distribute the cup, please?
Okay, Mr. Kevin, if you'd ask for the Lord's blessing on the cup, please. Lord, thank you for uh, sacrificing yourself on the cross again for us. And mm. Please, your, that your blood helps us be whiter than snow. In Jesus' name, mm. amen. Mm. Amen. Whiter than snow forever. Let's drink and celebrate. For as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you do sure proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Kevin. You guys think I always look dignified? Yes. yes. Always. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. I didn't think this was a... We are living a literal miracle as we speak. Do you realize we are on schedule <laughs> Amen. in our service? In fact, we are a, are a minute ahead. Oh, so I'm going to burn through that minute, I'll tell you. <laughs> we have before us two men that we're going to ordain to New Testament church positions. That would be uh, Jose and Gus. Jose and Gus, custom made for what they're going to be doing. <laughs> custom made. Hi, Sarah. Nice to see you back. I think it's a special day. Go to slide two, please. Can you do that, Lauren? Are we, or are you, are you, I see your fingers moving on it, so I'm not sure Try where you're. Your <laughs> I got it. Okay. Well, what is ordination? Ordination, the word means to designate someone to a specific position to perform a specific task. Uh, to qualify for ordination, a person must have met the specific biblical qualifications um, that have been, ver and, and, and honestly, the whole group here is verified that these men have. We personally know them, um, and we are moving forward with their appointment to these positions. These men have been found to be fully qualified. Unless there's a reason to change the designation, I believe the appointment is permanent. Unlike an individual's baptism, uh, which is done once and is generally accepted by other churches of like faith and practice, the authority of elders and deacons in this church is limited to this church. Uh, we who are elders and deacons in this church don't take that authority outside of this particular group of um, believers in Jesus Christ, nor do we accept ordinations to the positions of elder and deacon done at other churches. For good reason, each church is self-governing in this area. These two men, as I have said, are qualified for the job that we're going to ordain them to. I say job, I probably shouldn't use that word. Calling is a much better word. It's a calling from God uh, to, um, to a position that honestly has huge impact on the life of a church. And praise the Lord for these two guys. Slide three, please, Lauren. Paul knew what kind of uh, believers were best qualified to serve the church, so he provided Timothy uh, a list of qualifications required for church leaders, and we've looked through all this over the last, oh, month -ish or so. Uh, he also provided Titus with a corresponding list of qualifications. So churches to this day, and do and should use these guidelines along with prayer uh, to select elders, deacons, and other church leaders. But the entire Bible really is a script of God's standard for conduct and should be used as such. 
So when we look at these two men, as they are being uh, ordained to specific uh, positions today, they have been examined against the criteria set forth in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, and have been found to fit, fit the mold. Slide 4, please. A couple key verses for the day. Titus 1, 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete. This is Paul talking to Titus. That thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. Now we looked at this and uh, obviously elders, there are multiple elders in every church. Uh, Pastor Jerry and I have been elders together for... Long time. Long time. Long time. And uh, it has been an awesome ride. Mm -hmm. So this verse speaks of ordaining elders. Acts 6 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven honest or men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may ordain or appoint over this business. And this verse speaks of ordaining deacons. Okay, so elders and deacons should be ordained to their positions by their respective church. When you look at that, uh, those two verses, we see the word ordain in Titus 1.5, the word appoint in Acts 6.3, they are the same Greek word. They are both the word ordain. So that's what we're doing today is ordaining these men to their positions. Slide five, please, Lauren. So as we ordain these men to their positions today in our church, we're going to use 2 Timothy chapter 2 as our text to charge them before God. So if you want to start flipping to 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul is writing to Timothy about what will be needed in Timothy's role as a leader in the church. Uh, the same direction applies to us today. <laughs> Slide 6, please, Lauren. In the first seven verses of this chapter... Paul compares and relates ministry to four secular occupations. A teacher, a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. Do I have them all up there? I do. Okay. So as we look at what Paul wrote here in this chapter, remember that his writings were intended really to have their full impact right up to the rapture of the church. 2 Timothy 2 applies to church leadership right up until the time the Lord takes us all home. First of all, Timothy is called to be a teacher. Slide 7, please. 2 Timothy 2.1 You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Honestly, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Where else is there any source of strength for anyone, church leadership or no? Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses... Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So as a student, Timothy was taught many things by Paul. Uh, as a pastor, Timothy must now teach those things to other godly people. So the role of leadership in teaching the church is, is truly a, a servant leadership position. Uh, through sound teaching, church leadership is to bring out in others what Jesus Christ has gifted them to do. Uh, and to help them to do it well. That's what this call to teach, I think, encompasses, is to bring out in others what Jesus Christ has gifted them to do, and then to help them do it well. That's what the church leadership does. Second, Timothy is called to be a soldier. Go to slide eight, please, Lauren. He says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. How many military folks have we got here? Prior military, I mean, yeah, all over the place. Some still active duty, right, Regina? Right. So when Regina says, tin hut, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> Look for a tin hut, right? <laughs> he says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. There's a lot there. So as a soldier, you're called to give all your energies to the warfare. That is serving Jesus Christ. Rule number two that I see there is you have to fight to win. We're not in this battle 
as church leadership to be even, keep things even. We are here to win. We're here to bring people to Jesus Christ. We're here to defeat the enemy. That's why we're here. We're here not to, not to come out a tie or a draw. We are here to win. So this means leading from the front uh, by being involved in people's lives. That's how this is done. We are involved in people's lives, those that don't know the Lord so that they may, those that do know the Lord so that they may serve him better. Also, as a, as a soldier, you are to give none of your energies to world affairs. That's what uh, Timothy is being called to here. And this speaks to serving one master and one master only. We serve Jesus Christ. We don't serve Jesus Christ and we serve Jesus Christ. Third, Timothy is called to be an athlete. Slide nine. It's kind of nice to be a pastoral athlete because my athlete days are over. <laughs> They're long gone. Verse five. And also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Uh, an athlete strives for the victor's crown. That's what Paul stresses to the Corinthians, to Timothy here. An athlete strives for the victor's crown. And you put all your energy into it because there is only one winner. Now we know we'll all be winners, right? As he's not saying there's not multiple winners. He's saying, go for the gusto, serve Jesus Christ as if there is only one winner. Meaning there's only one crown and you want it. Put your whole self into it. We're to strive for that victor's crown. So to strive for second place, it's not a thing, is it? Second place is what? The first winner. I mean, first loser. First loser. Yeah. English. Yeah. Yeah. Now he's, uh, and, and, and talking in this verse about uh, following the rules, the critical part of your calling is to understand sound doctrine and to strive to keep it pure. That's what he is telling Timothy. Understand the word of God and live by it. Live by it. Fourth, Timothy is called to be a farmer. Slide 10, please. I always wanted to, I thought maybe I'd end up there someday, but, uh, but Granny said, eh, let's look at something else. <laughs> so we didn't end up being farmers. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. A farmer lives entirely by his faith. Do you realize that? A farmer lives entirely by his faith, dependent upon God for rain, for sun, for harvest, for everything. His analogy using a farmer is so appropriate because a farmer lives his entire life, every aspect of it, by faith in God. There is nothing a farmer does that isn't done by faith. Nothing. We grew up on farms. And we, uh, I spent my time on a tractor seat, and everything we did, didn't know it at the time, was based entirely on God. Him sending the rain, him sending the sun, which he takes credit for. He says, I do those things so that the world may know that I am he. We represent him. So this analogy as a farmer is awesome. A farmer uses good tools. He uses hard work, the sweat of his brow, and a love for the land if he wants to have a large crop. Okay, this crop is both from a church leadership perspective, both personal and it is also church-wide. In the personal realm, a hardworking farmer or a church leader who serves God correctly receives a crown. That is out there for church leaders who serve God well. In the church-wide crop, others are gonna receive heavenly rewards because of the hard work you put into growing them. The planting of the seed, the nourishing of it, the sprouting of it, them becoming something for God and then you recognizing in them what those skills are that can be best used to serve God at this time in this place and then cutting them loose to do that as best as they can. All that comes together uh, under the hands of the farmer, the church leader. So their success as farmers in their own right is gonna be added to your account. Okay, slide 11, please, Lauren. 
Then he says to, to him, he says, consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. He says, if you comprehend these four analogies, the teacher, the soldier, an athlete, and a farmer, and implement their message in your own life, and in the lives of others, you will succeed beyond your wildest dreams. But it isn't an easy road. It is not an easy road. Uh, I don't remember an easy day in the ministry, really. Um, uh, and honestly, when you go down that road, you don't expect it, and really you don't want it. Because if you're having easy roads, it's because you're not engaged as you should be. That's what it is all about. Uh, I think, Granny, you walked beans too, right? Yeah, we spent uh, every daylight hour through most of our summers working fields. Hmm. That's what we did. Uh, and then when it got dark, well, then I'd go find Granny, right? And we'd go down to the river and have a can of chili. What an awesome life. When you put on the role of a church leader, there are no easy days. If there are easy days, you kind of got to wonder, I'm just not being told what's going on, am I? <laughs> That's the way it is, okay? Slide 12, please. We're not left alone to do all this. The source of strength you're going to need to achieve this, really this mighty calling uh, in your lives is found in one place, and that is Jesus Christ. Verse 8. Have they got verse 8 up there? I do. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. When Jesus Christ as the God-man overcame death, he put on full display his unconquerable power uh, over all things. When Paul says, according to my gospel here, uh, he's telling us to preach the resurrection as the source of strength for the gospel message. The resurrection is the source of our strength. Without the resurrection, what do we have? Nothing. With the resurrection, what do we have? Everything. The resurrection made that big a difference. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have an eternal future. Uh, we're to draw on that strength from the truth and power of the resurrection and pass on that passion to others. Verse 9 says, For which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not changed. So the road, I'm telling you, is not going to be without its bumps. It'll have its bumps. Anytime you stand for God's truth, there's going to be times when you'll be treated as a criminal. What was Paul's offense? Preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel. The price you're going to pay for following the Lord as a leader in the church is going to be significant. It may not be physical chains. I, I, and honestly, we all hope not. Nobody wants to end up that way. But you will, without doubt, there will be a, a, a lot of emotional issues uh, that are going to weigh on you when you make the decision, when you go down the road. Because other people's issues now become yours. And now you are the one that will help them see God and how to, to handle those situations. It's, uh, it can be a heavy load at times, but you're going to see that God's word is not bound by those who hate him. I think you're going you're gonna to experience greater blessings in these roles than you ever thought possible. Honestly. And then on the other side of eternity, even more so. When you take on these roles, I think you have to take them on with the thought of looking to the future. You can't live in the day. You have to live for the future. You have to live for what's out there. And always remember that God's messengers may be chained, but the word of God never is. Some of the greatest messages Paul preached were when he had chains. But the word of God was not changed. So chained. So preach the word. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, preach the word. Verse 10 says, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul was faithfully sticking with the ministry because he sees it as bigger than himself. Honestly, that's what he is saying there. You're going to represent God to others. Now, if God called you to do something that was within your own strength to achieve, how would you achieve it? In your own strength. Poorly. Poorly, yeah. But in moving to church leadership, 
you're going to be faced with situations that are beyond your scope of experience. There will never be a time, I don't think, when you could say, I have arrived, and, and you can write a, a tell-all book to, for future pastors so that they need not struggle through these same situations. There's always something new. There will never be a time when you don't need to depend on Jesus Christ, really for every breath you take and every word you consider saying. That is the point. If God called us to do something I could do in my own strength, I would. But when he calls church leadership, he calls you to something that is bigger than you are and always will be. There will never be a time when you, when you sit back and, and can smugly say, I've seen this before. I know what to do. <laughs> not without consulting your scriptures, not without consulting God in prayer. It's just the way it is. Slide 13, please. Paul ends this part of the commission for Timothy and for really all church leadership with these words. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. This is what he's telling Timothy. The reference isn't to martyrdom for Christ here, but I think what he's telling him is that a believer's spiritual identification is with the death and the life of Christ. He's saying, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. To understand this charge, I got a cross-reference up here that I want you to look at. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So what he's talking about here is that when you got saved, your life was hid with Christ in God, which is what Pastor Briggs was talking about in our Lord's Supper service. So as you look to things above and lead others to do the same, you're going to live a life of joy in Christ that will shock you with its overwhelming intensity. It will shock you what God will do. As you sit back and see his hand move in the situations that you get involved in. There is no calling in life that could ever take you down that road that will challenge and fulfill you more than church leadership. Nothing. The President of the United States doesn't have your challenges. He has his own. I'll just let it stop there. <laughs> But he doesn't have your challenges. When you talk about uh, church leadership, it is a huge thing. Slide 14. He says, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. This charge tells us that as church leaders, to endure is, for, is to further your identification with Christ. And this parallels uh, another verse here. I've got them up there, good. Um, Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Any price we, sit, we, we, we pay to serve Jesus Christ in life will be worth it when we get to eternity. Nothing here should daunt us there. Um, I, I liked what you said, Pastor Briggs, with the, uh, the fact that sin is taken care of, so the big deal is already handled. Mm -hmm. The big deal is already handled. Christ endured and will one day reign. 1 Corinthians 15, 25, For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Those saints who endure, those leaders, church leaders who endure, will one day reign with him. I think that's part of the, the gifts the, um, that he brings with him when he comes. Revelations 3, 21, The rewards. To him who overcomes, I, Jesus Christ, will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down uh, with my father on his throne. So this charge tells us that church leaders are to endure whatever comes, and, um, and that when we do, we will further our identification with Jesus Christ. Slide 15, please, Lord. If we deny him, he will deny us. This charge, I think, speaks to the possibility of apostasy. I see this charge as being spoken against those who seek church leadership for other than honorable reasons. 
Those who deny Jesus Christ in their teaching and their lives may desire a leadership role, but the ones he's talking about here are those who want to move into a leadership role in a church who don't know him in salvation. Hebrews 10.38 says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Those who deny Jesus Christ are not saved. And that leads to their appointment with him as judge. They're going to hear those words, I never knew you at that meeting. Remember as he closed out the Sermon on the Mount at the end of Matthew 7, and, he, and he's, these guys are saying, Lord, have I not done all these things in, in, in thy name? What was his response? I never knew you. I never knew you. We never had a relationship. And off to hell they go. This is a warning to those who don't know the Lord in salvation, who desire church leadership, don't do it. Don't do it, because God takes it very seriously. Well, Paul told Timothy more about what he means in his first letter to him. You go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaks expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Where do they speak these lies? In the church. In the church. He is warning Timothy, you're going to have false teachers coming in. Watch out for them. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron, it isn't like they care about the souls of men if they don't even care about their own. Forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God had created to be received with, the th with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature is a, is, is a, of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So, Sage Creek Bible Church, we have looked at your doctrine, we have looked at your lives, and believe the evidence that you have clearly uh, shown us that you were identified with Christ and that that is so. Uh, I have never been more confident of anything in my life. So I'm looking forward to, to serving you in these new roles. So this particular verse, if we deny him, he will also deny us, speaks to the charge of apostasy. Don't struggle with this from the perspective that, whoa, if I crack under pressure of persecution, he'll, he'll, he'll deny me. That's not what he's talking about at all. He's talking about church leaders who should not be church leaders. Those that have denied him and then gotten into the pulpit. That's what he's talking about. Okay, slide 16. Because here's our story. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So this charge speaks of a true child of God who nevertheless stumbles in his faith walk. Do you think that can't happen to a believer? Oh my goodness, it can. Oh my goodness, it can. Look at poor Abraham. Wednesday night, we talked about five times when that happened to Abraham, the father of our faith, the one we're all to look to. So nobody leads a perfect life. Nobody gets there without some scars and bumps along the way. To occasionally falter in our faith by wondering what God is up to uh, is an... It's an unexpected thing, I think, to us, but in reality, uh, every believer experiences it at some time. As you wonder, what God are you up to? It isn't that we doubt God is there or anything like that. We just don't know the plan. He knows the plan, and he'll choose to share it with us when he does. Uh, and honestly, that's where you walk by faith. Abraham, the father of our faith, he saw his faith falter at times along the way that were amazing to me. But when those times come, we are told to get up, to renew our commitment to Jesus Christ and get back on the trail, just like Abraham did. One thing you gotta say about Abraham, the father of our faith, the reason he's called that is because he never quit walking. He never quit walking. Every day he got up, they packed up their tents and, and uh, loaded the camels and off they went for another day, another 10 miles. They never quit. Even when they were wondering, Lord, what are you up to? They continued on their journey. And that's what he's calling us to do. 
It says God cannot disown himself. He's not going to deny us when we have that happen to us. When we step back and in our humanness say, God, I don't understand. I am at a place now where I don't know what to do. I don't know what you want me to do. I don't know what to do for this person. I don't know. That's when he will help you. I'm telling you, experience has told me that's when things come through. That's when the spirit works with your spirit. Uh, and here, true children of God cannot ever become something other than children of God, even when we have those times of stumbling. Christ's faithfulness to Christians isn't contingent on my faithfulness to him. He's the one who bought me. I didn't buy him. So when those times come, and, and I guarantee you they will, things will, be, will appear to be over and above what anything you could ever do. Trust him. He'll get you through. Trust him. And the next time it's a little easier to trust him. And then over the years you get to the point where you just say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to handle this, but I'm excited to see. That's how it works. Slide 17. Well, what's next? We're on schedule. We're up. We have three minutes to wrap up the message. We're going to be on schedule. So if you guys, if you guys cooperate, we're going to make this. Okay? <laughs> so with all of that said, now Paul will tell Timothy what's next after he goes through this. How about you guys? What's next? 2 Timothy 2.14. Go to slide 18. Remind them of these things. This is what he's telling us to do as church leadership. Remind them of these things. All the things we just talked about. He says, remind them of those things. Charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and uh, Philetus are of this sort. They were the ones that he's talking about who snuck in. They have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. That is the commission to church leadership, to remind them of these things. And one of the things we need to remind our church of constantly and consistently is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ leads to our resurrection and the rapture and the resurrection of the dead is out in front of us. It is yet to come. It hasn't come and gone. You haven't missed it. You haven't missed it. It is yet to come. You ever woke up in the middle of the, of the night and, and there's no granny in bed beside you and you think, ah, the rapture happened and I missed it. But she has committed to me not to go without me. So, yeah, 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 the sound that clears it all up for you. Yeah. No, uh, we are to be constantly on good doctrine, out ahead of these things, so that when the false doctrine comes in, people can say, you know what, that's not what I heard last week from my pulpit. I heard good stuff from my pulpit, and this doesn't match. That's where the good teaching comes in. He goes on in verse 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. What is the solid foundation of God? His word, right? His word, that is our solid foundation. It stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Should we not be challenging our fellow believers to depart from iniquity? To set sin aside? To serve God as though we believe he is there. And he is at every moment. That's what church leadership does. That's how you win a popularity contest, by the way. You preach on sin and call people to walk away from it. They'll love you for it. Right? They will love you. Go to slide 19, please, Lauren. Here's some more. I'm not going to read these verses. This is verse 20 down through 26. But for your sake here, I, I want to synopsize uh, these verses, all these verses. Go to slide 20. 
Gus talked about this this morning. Remind your people of the great uh, spiritual or scriptural truths. That's what we're to do. That's what church leadership does. We have our core doctrines, but doctrine, what am I talking today? Today, what I'm saying to you is doctrine. Every time you open your mouth about the Word of God, you are teaching doctrine. Now, we have core doctrines that we believe are essential if we're going to have fellowship together. And these are what they are, the virgin birth of Christ. If you don't believe in the virgin birth of Christ, what does that do to the identity of Christ? Hmm. It, it, it destroys it, doesn't it? How about the deity of Christ? If he is not God in the flesh, what happened when he died on the cross? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing happened. How about the word of God? Can you trust the word of God? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you need to obey the word of God? Yes. Absolutely. How about the gospel message? Did it change your life? Yes. Should it be preached so that it can change other people's lives? Yes. Church leadership leads down that road. Salvation by grace through faith alone. What if I throw in a little bit of my own works to make it good? What have I done? Make, make Christ's sacrifice no and void. I have, haven't I? Okay, how about Jesus is coming again? Why is that even a thing? Because he said he was. Because he said he was, and shouldn't I live my life like he could be coming five seconds from now? I think we should. And I can say when I meet the Lord, if he comes in five seconds, I was preaching to him, Lord, about sin. You know that. And I will say you over time. No, I still got 20 minutes. I have never gone over time, Kirsten. And the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, why is that all so important or even is it? Because each one of them is the same God. A triune God represented in three different ways. And if it not be so, what is the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> if that is not God, what is it? It's a problem, that's what it is. How about the security of the believer? Once you are saved and your soul is in God's hands for its safekeeping, would he ever say, you know, this one just didn't work out. No. <laughs> you know? Uh, we'll send him back into the wild and see if good things come of it. No! No! How can you serve God fearlessly if you think at any moment you might be chucked by the great God that you serve? No! I'm telling you, you can serve God without fear. Without fear, because your soul is safe in his hands. Your soul is safe in his hands. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. How many of them at the end? Uh, we just got done reading uh, Love's. Uh, you know, there were times when he wanted out of that mess. But that doesn't mean he didn't love God. That meant he was just like me. He wanted to live to a ripe old age. And in one piece. So, but love didn't make it in one piece, did he? He made it in two. B. Warn them against petty arguments, verse 14. Warn them against petty arguments. How many arguments do you hear do you think are worth listening to? The, the one against your wife. Yeah, yeah, there you go, yeah. <laughs> well, the Lord has examples for us. He said, some guy came up and he says, I want you to talk to my brother about dividing the inheritance. What did the Lord tell him? Not my job. What did, go ahead. Who made me? Yeah, who made me a divider? Not my job. We have important things to do. And splitting hairs over petty arguments isn't one of them. So he is telling Timothy to tell the church to grow up. <laughs> grow up. Conduct yourselves as adults. That's what, we're, that's what part of church leadership does. I'm going to leave that to Jose. Yeah, we'll vote for Jose to take that message, right? How about strive to become an approved workman of God? 2.15. Well, how do you do that? The scriptures tell us by spending time in the word. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That's how you do it. How about avoiding godless controversies? And there's plenty of those. 
uh, the examples here that he gives, he points out Hymenus, uh, Hymenaeus, I guess, and Philetus, they had been uh, involved in a controversy about when the resurrection was, had, they said it had already occurred. The error is that they claimed that in, since, since it's already occurred, they're telling these people, you guys missed it. Mm. You missed it. But wouldn't the people that are saying that also missed it? Yes, yes, but there's always wiggle room there. There's always wiggle room, I'm sure. That's a good point, but I'm sure they had an escape hatch. And then, you know, in verses 23 to 26, Timothy has got to gently instruct those who would oppose him with the goal of leading them to repentance. That is not an easy role. That's why you pick mature people to church leadership uh, roles there. And then present your body as a clean vessel to God. Well, how do you do that? Well, every once in a while, we talk about sin and, and the results of sin. The people in the church need to know God's expectations. Leading a life where you serve God and walk away from sin has nothing to do with whether you are saved or not or getting you saved. It has everything to do with the fact that you are saved and you want to serve God better, more, uh, more fully, as he desires you to. You go down the sanctification process. As you were a sinner, you're now saved by grace, but that old sin nature continues to play. And the idea behind church leadership is to strengthen the new man, that that new man may be where you live now. Does anything in the scriptures ever tell us we need to clean the old man up? No, no. That guy is, he's, he's done. He, his goose is cooked. But you and the new man, you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. That's where we're to live. And how about avoiding evil and pursuing good? Verse 22. Wow, that's about what? Six things that church leadership does and should do on a regular recurring basis. Slide 21, please. Now we're going to kind of get to the laying on of the hands. Do you guys know who that is? I don't either. <laughs> it was a, I just grabbed that picture because it kind of shows an Old Testament Jewish tradition. And that signifies a request for God to bless the acceptance of an individual to a role by the group. So we as New Testament believers, we, we tend to follow that tradition and do the same thing. And we're going to do that this morning. But we'll also remember what Jesus did with his hands. Do you want to do a fascinating Bible study tonight when you get home? <coughs> fascinating Bible study. Take the word hand and see what verse... Sarah, am I too loud? Okay. <laughs> am I too loud? No. I am? Kirsten, you're, now I'm... Now, you've opened the doors. You asked. You asked. <laughs> what did the Lord Jesus do with his hands? He healed. Matthew, uh, go to slide 22. Maybe I've got it on a slide. Yeah. Jesus holds us with his hands when our faith is weak. Matthew 14, 31. Matthew 8, 3. Jesus cleanses the unclean by his touch. Luke 24, 39, he showed us his humanity by his hands. How did he do that in Luke 24, 39? Because he had resurrected and he still had the scars. He had the scars. Yeah. And he told, uh, he told uh, uh, Thomas what? Yeah. Stick your fingers in the holes, Thomas. You want some proof? <laughs> yeah. What did Thomas say? <laughs> My Lord and my God. Yeah, my Lord and my God. John 20, 27. His hands show the scars of his sacrifice for us. On his hands. Revelation 1, 16 and Revelation 2, 1. He held seven stars in his right hand. I believe those stars are the pastors of those churches. The elders, the leaders. He held them in his hand. He holds church leadership in his hand. And Revelation 1.17, he placed his right hand on John to remove fear. Sarah, she's not bothering us. Oh, okay. She's bothering me, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he did with his hands. I'm just going to tell you two guys that when we put our hands on you, that ain't what we're doing. 
I can't do any of those things, and anybody in the room who would claim to, you better check them out. Okay, go back to the middle message and say, hmm, how's your doctrine? Hmm. But what we're going to do now is tell you and show you uh, with our prayers. Um, Pastor Briggs and I will pray, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll have her pray as well. Um, but we want to come together as a church to let you guys know what we think of all this. Mm. Uh, we are excited beyond words about this whole opportunity for you to serve the Lord in these roles. I can say I've never been more sure of anything in, in ministry in my whole life than what we're doing here today. Uh, I vacillated more on myself than I ever did on YouTube. <laughs> so as I assessed myself against the criteria to make sure I fit that criteria and continue to do so. Uh, so what we'd like to do, before we go to that, does anybody have a testimony about these two guys that you want to say? We have three minutes. Oh, cut it off. Okay. All right. Well, as this thing goes down uh, in church leadership, it isn't just these two guys. Uh, was it two weeks ago we talked about uh, their wives and their kids and the, and the parts that they play in all this? And it is absolutely huge. Absolutely huge. Uh, in our house, um, uh, everything we do revolves around ministry. And when we get a call, uh, Granny is, is there. Uh, hospice. Somebody here. Um, it, the, the Lord has, has blessed us with partners who are um, absolutely, utterly amazing. Um, and then there's Kirsten. I have some... <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Kirsten. Um, honestly, I would, I would make one recommendation to Denise and Kirsten. Um, it is not an easy road. It is not. Uh, you, will, um, you will be challenged like Sarah. We're going to talk about that Wednesday night. I am amazed at Abraham. I really am. I'm amazed at Abraham. I am more amazed at Sarah. I, I, am, I, I, I am more amazed. I think of the two of them, she was the strength of the faith. Uh, I do. Uh, we'll talk more about that Wednesday night, even though her track record was not perfect. But in, in marriage and in, and in church leadership roles, it's a partnership, and then the kids too. There are times when dad's not here. Well, where is he? Well, he had to go. Um, and where's mom? She's with him. So um, for all of that, I'm going to say thank you now, uh, just in case the Lord comes back and I don't get a chance to later. Uh, I am going to say I thank you from the bottom of my heart with all the love that I've ever felt for my fellow uh, believers that, um, that you guys are taking this on and, uh, and thank you. You'll just have to set in that. So if you two guys would come on down. Jose, do you want to borrow my tie? To make this official, or are you okay? He's got a jacket. Yes. All right. I'm just, yeah. Just in case the rapture comes halfway through this, then he'll show up without a tie. And, yeah. So, yeah. He'll be okay. He's got a jacket. All right. Um, I would like the church to come forward, and then. Um, and then Pastor Briggs, if you would open in prayer. Um, and then where is Herb? Okay, Herb, would you um, would you bring up those packages for us? This is Maxwell's leadership Bible. Maxwell, I think he has done the, um, 
uh, to the heavy lifting on a lot of books in the scriptures like Nehemiah. You go here, and it's a study Bible that focuses on church leadership. There are answers here that may not occur to you as these situations come up. There are cues that he has back to the scriptures to help you through times on situations that you may not have experienced before. And then, as is our habit, we have spared every expense to get you, to get you, well, we've got, Herb has thrown in two pocket watches so that you'll never need to depend on that clock. It'll always be on time. That's always wrong. And then there is a, that's, that's, that one's Gus's. <laughs> and Jose? This is Jose's. Okay, you want to give that to him. Oops, Gus. That's to you. And this is to you. This is your watch, Gus. So Sunday school will start at 9.30. Sure. We can just, I guess we can just leave them here. Okay, Jose's and Gus's. If you haven't signed them, please sign them before they grab them while we're having our pop-up. I don't think anybody's signed them yet. You got to sign it downstairs. Oh, we're going to present it first. All right. So now we come to the conclusion of our, of our ceremony, and as I said, we can't do what the Lord did with his hands. Nowhere close. But we represent him. By golly, we represent him. We represent the one who can do all that with his hands. Uh, we love you guys, and um, we intend to make your job easy. <laughs> as best as we can. So, this I have Christian. Yes. So, Pastor Briggs, if you'd open us in prayer, and then Herb, if you will pray, and then I'll close us. <clears throat> Our Father, we are coming to you and with the thanks for what you have done. As Pastor Terry's brought out, we couldn't possibly be more pleased and blessed and proud in a good way of the men that you have gifted us with. So we thank you for them, their wives, their families, their ministries, and their testimonies. Give you the praise and the glory for each thing. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Father in heaven, in closing, I would like to also thank you and, and, and agree with everything that's been brought before your throne this, this, this morning. I want to thank you for Pastor Jose and for Deacon Gus that you've given them to us. And we ask, Father, that you'll strengthen them with might by your spirit and inner man. And I ask your blessing on the food downstairs. And I pray all this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father. Amen. Our Father, as we, as we close in prayer, uh, we know the old devil and our flesh are always active. Uh, may these two men be specially blessed in that area of protection against our enemies. May you bless them. Uh, may they walk uprightly. May they walk with courage. May they walk with the thought that even when there may feel like times when they're alone, they are not. Uh, your hand is on them. Uh, this time that we're spending now with our hands joined around us um, indicates to us fully that your hand is on them. May they never forget that. May they never doubt that. May they constantly find comfort in that thought. Asking, Lord, you would take them deeper into the word of God than they have ever been. May you bless their studies. May you open up new horizons for them that they never even knew were there. May the new galaxies of the word of God energize them and, and, and make them reach further and further out uh, as they grow in these roles. And Lord, may the problems that arise that they'll be involved in, may those problems be um, beyond their reach to solve, that they would learn to walk with you to solve those things. Uh, that they would constantly and forever remember that none of this can ever be done in our own strength if it's ever going to be done completely and if it's ever going to be done well. Now, we are thankful, Lord, and, uh, and for Herb and for Pastor Briggs and for others in this church who have been a part of, of, uh, of their education over the years. 
uh, we're praying that you uh, that you bless them now as we move forward and that of their family. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, Jared. Rosalie says I can't have the Bibles until she gets to sign it. All right. Uh, all right. <laughs> Take a boy. <laughs>